The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The SNP Government have said they want to hold another divisive independence referendum in October next year. Uh, but Nicola Sturgeon can't even say if ferries will float by then. She won't have closed the school attainment gap by then. She won't have returned NHS services to normal by then. And she won't have cleared the court backlogs by then. So, First Minister, why should all these pressing issues play second fiddle to another divisive independence referendum next year? First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, let me uh, welcome Douglas Ross's line of questioning. It is at least an implicit, if not yet an explicit, recognition that, yes, people in Scotland will have their say on independence. In line, in line with the democratic mandate that this Parliament has. Um, second point, Presiding Officer, is that the case for independence is not distinct or separate from the big challenges that Scotland, in common with countries across the world, is facing right now. Instead, independence is part of the solution to those challenges. It is about how we equip ourselves better as a country to meet those challenges and fulfil our potential. Uh, it is not the distraction that Douglas Ross wants to pretend it is. Instead, it presents an alternative to a failing UK system. A failing UK system that gives us, right now, a Prime Minister with no democratic or moral mandate in Scotland, that has given us a Brexit we did not vote for, that is giving us the highest inflation in the G7, the lowest projected growth in the G20, with the sole exception uh, of Russia, that is constraining our public finances and tying the hands of this government. And of course, uh, a UK system that gives us the obscenity of a government that tries uh, to shore up its own base by deporting vulnerable people to Rwanda, utterly immoral. So independence is an alternative to that, and it gives this parliament additional powers to navigate those challenges and to meet the full massive potential of this country. Douglas Ross. What, what a depressing answer from the First Minister. Never once, never once responding to the points about education, about our NHS, about the justice system, we will hear Mr Ross, thank you, never once responding to these issues that are pressing for people across Scotland right now, which will be playing second fiddle to an independence referendum, because we know that the First Minister cannot focus on improving our country when she is trying to divide it all over again. And we can see right now what happens when this SNP government is distracted. The census was a shambles because the Constitution Secretary, looking up to the sky, maybe for some divine inspiration, was too busy updating the UK bad bar charts to actually count the number of people in yeah. Scotland. Yeah. That's yeah. what happens when time and resources are thrown squarely behind things that really should matter. Mistakes are made and the people of Scotland are the ones who suffer. Let's look at Scotland's NHS. Waiting lists are continually hitting record highs across our health service, from A&E to cancer diagnosis. Patients are waiting years for essential treatment. First Minister, why doesn't Scotland's NHS deserve your full focus right now? First Minister. These issues have my full focus, and, but since Douglas Ross uh, has raised them, first I'm going to come on point by point. Uh, to take on uh, the issues that Douglas Ross has raised, um, and he should listen carefully uh, to that. But firstly, he talks about bar charts. Uh, what every one of these bar charts showed uh, in the publication that we produced on Tuesday of this week is that across 10 uh, different countries with different characteristics, but all of them independent across Europe, comparator countries to Scotland, they are wealthier. They are fairer. Uh, they have better well-being than Scotland as part of the UK. They make the case for Scotland becoming an independent country. But let me set out. Let me 
of course, set out uh, the ways in which this government is using our current powers uh, and in doing so making the case for more power. So let's look at the economy. Uh, in the most recent quarter, Scotland's GDP grew, the rest of the UK contracted. Unemployment right now is lower in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. Unlike the rest of the UK, Scotland is a positive trade balance in goods with the rest of the world. Uh, we have the position as the top performing we will of the hear, UK we will for hear the first investment minister outside of London. First Minister. We will hear the First Minister. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, business research and development up under this government under this government by 99.5% compared to under 30% in the rest of the UK. Let's turn to schools. According to the OECD, Scotland has the highest proportion uh, of 25 to 65 year olds uh, in the UK with post-secondary education. Of all UK nations, we have the highest number of teachers. Uh, we have the highest number of schools per 100,000 pupils. Uh, on the last exam day, we saw higher passes at the highest level in the history of devolution. Access to university. The Independent Fair Access Commissioner says that Scotland has set the pace with regard to fair access across the UK. And of course, we've got free tuition in Scotland. And finally, presiding officer, uh, on justice, recorded crime at one of the lowest levels since 1974, down 41% under this government. And lastly, presiding officer, health and social care. We have record staff numbers, Briefly, higher Minister. staff numbers than other parts of the UK, and we have the best paid staff anywhere in the UK. If that's what we can do with the powers of devolution, imagine how much better we can do with the powers of independence. Douglas Ross. <laughs> the, the First Minister's answers are as selective as her bar chart because, yes, yet yes. again, nothing about the attainment gap. What happened, First Minister, to that being your number one priority? And now two questions about the NHS and two answers that never mention our NHS because these issues are put on the back burner. These issues are put on the back burner. These issues Members. are... These issues for the SNP and the SNP government are put on the back burner when they have set a date for an illegal referendum in just 16 months' time. Nicola Sturgeon is distracted all over again, and we know what happens next. Every time the SNP campaign for another referendum, Scotland's drug deaths spiral. The First Minister has admitted it herself. Members! The First Minister has admitted it herself. Mm -hmm. She took her eye off the ball and people lost their lives. And the latest figures show Nicola Sturgeon's drug death scandal remains the worst in Europe. Mm -hmm. We've brought forward a solution that we could implement straight away. Our right to recovery bill now has cross-party support. Nicola Sturgeon's government could throw its weight behind it and we could pass that bill now, yeah. this yeah. year. So, First Minister, why should a referendum bill be passed before you sort out Scotland's drug death scandal? First Minister. Firstly, on drug death, I have said, and people uh, listening to these sessions of First Minister's questions will have heard me say this, uh, we will look very sympathetically at Douglas Ross's bill when Douglas Ross publishes uh, that bill. Uh, we can't do that until the bill is published. Uh, so I hope we can uh, find consensus and agreement. There have been some concerns raised about what might be in the bill by experts. There are other experts who have voiced real support for it. So uh, that willingness to work together is there. Uh, of course, we're investing £250 million over this Parliament to tackle drug deaths. And while there is no room uh, for complacency, uh, we've seen in uh, recent statistics a reduction in the number of drug deaths, uh, suspected drug deaths, over uh, the months uh, to March 2021. Uh, going back to other aspects of Douglas Ross's question, he said uh, bizarrely uh, that in my previous answer I didn't mention the NHS or the attainment gap. Uh, I mentioned both. Uh, I pointed to the Commissioner for Fair Access. A core part of tackling the attainment gap is to reduce that in access to university. Uh, and the Independent Commissioner has described uh, our progress as an unambiguous success. I also mentioned uh, the NHS, the fact that we have record staff numbers and the best paid uh, staff 
anywhere in the UK. Uh, lastly, uh, Douglas Ross should really stop. There is a real desperation at the heart of Douglas Ross's approach to independence. It's very telling, it's very telling, isn't it, that he is so terrified of the substantive debate on independence, so terrified of the verdict of the Scottish people on independence, that he's reduced to somehow trying to pretend that democracy in Scotland is illegal. It is not a question of whether uh, this government respects the rule of law. We do and always will. The question is, is Briefly, Douglas First Ross Minister. a Democrat? And I think the glaring answer to that is no. Douglas Ross. First Minister, your priorities are all wrong at the worst possible time. It is a crucial moment right now for public services and our economy. We have just gone through a pandemic. War in Europe has hiked energy prices. There is a global cost of living crisis. It is time for us all to pull together and focus on improving public services, on creating jobs, on restoring schools, on fighting crime, on supporting our NHS. Scotland has the potential to rebuild stronger. A focus on our recovery is what the Scottish people overwhelmingly want. A focus on our recovery. That's what Scottish people overwhelmingly want, not a referendum. We need a strong government for all of Scotland, but we're getting a weak campaign group for the nationalist minority that values grievance over governing. Yeah. First Minister, why is the SNP's obsession with a referendum next year more important than the priorities of people across Scotland right now? First Minister. Independence is about ensuring that we can better meet the priorities of the Scottish people and deal with those challenges. Because what Douglas Ross needs to reflect on is that so many of these challenges that he has outlined are being exacerbated right now in Scotland because we are not independent. Brexit, taken out of the EU against our will. Uh, Brexit is, is why we are suffering the highest inflation in the G7, the lowest growth in the G20 apart from Russia. It's why we are seeing constrained uh, budgets. Uh, that's Brexit. And that happened to Scotland because we are not independent and people across the country are paying the price of it yeah. right now. Independence is the solution. Uh, and lastly, presiding officer, because we are not independent, uh, we currently have a Prime Minister that even Douglas Ross, well, this is the case today, it might not be tomorrow, doesn't think is fit for office. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, that the ethics advisor, the second ethics advisor to Boris Johnson, uh, who has resigned, has said this morning that the Prime Minister has placed him in an impossible and odious position. Uh, Douglas Ross seems to agree uh, with Christopher Geit that Boris Johnson is putting him in an odious position. Uh, the difference between Douglas Ross and Christopher Geit is that Christopher Geit has the decency and honour to resign. Yeah. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, today Audit Scotland has published the latest in a series of damning reports uncovering the SNP government's failures. It shows the government made over 300 spending announcements during the COVID pandemic but failed to monitor how that money was spent. Over 40 per cent of the additional funding for health and social care that came through Barnet Consequentials has not been spent. And the First Minister said at the election that her priority was COVID recovery, but Audit Scotland say there are billions of pounds of COVID money being held back while our public services, businesses and workers are crying out for support. Why is COVID recovery no longer your priority? Why has this money not been spent? And will you guarantee that every penny will be spent on rebuilding Scotland? First Minister. Uh, that is not what this morning's Audit Scotland report uh, shows. It's a very good, positive uh, report, uh, and we'll pay very close attention uh, to the recommendations it makes. So let me share some of what the Audit Scotland report actually says. The Scottish Government spent uh, more uh, on dealing with the pandemic, £15.5 billion, than was allocated through consequentials by the UK Government. The report actually only goes up uh, to December 
2021, not to the end of uh, the financial year. So, of course, at that time, some of the money is unallocated. And, of course, the pandemic is not completely behind us. So we need to continue, uh, without now the consequentials to support it, we need to continue to support the economy and our public services. The report also says the Scottish Government managed its overall budget effectively, that the Scottish uh, Government uh, developed some specific schemes that were unique in the UK. They didn't exist anywhere else in the UK. We acted with the essential urgency and speed. Uh, we relied on established systems to detect and to reduce uh, any fraud in the system and that we worked well with partners uh, across the country. Uh, yes, it suggests some lessons that we should learn and with all aspects of the pandemic, we will make sure we learn those lessons. Anna Sarwar. For the first time, the First Minister is denying the reality in the report. Uh, what it refers to is money that was committed but not spent. Uh, and it makes clear about reserves that, yes, it's a good thing to build reserves, but using emergency money to do it is not. It's the equivalent of taking a payday loan and putting it in your current savings account. It doesn't work and it isn't good for Scotland. But this isn't the first time that Audit Scotland have highlighted this government's incompetence. As is typical with this SNP government, there is a culture of contempt for anyone who dares ask a difficult question or exposes an inconvenient truth. Even when it's one of your own, they close ranks and give them a slap on the wrist instead. And now in the face of uncomfortable truths about their financial mismanagement, SNP figures are openly talking of, I quote, clipping the wings of Audit Scotland. They have already cut their budget by nearly a fifth since they came to power, and the spending review makes clear there are year on year of cuts to come. Isn't it the case that Nicola Sturgeon is cutting Audit Scotland's budget because it makes it harder for them to do their job, it makes it harder for them to expose this government's failures, and it makes it easier for her to get away with it? First Minister. Oh dear. I thought Anna Sarwar might have done some basic homework before uh, coming to this chamber. I've got some news uh, for Anna Sarwar on that point. Uh, the Scottish Government doesn't actually set the budget for Audit Scotland. The budget for Audit Scotland is independently funded through the Scottish Parliament uh, and the audit fees that public bodies pay for it. Members, so members, I would have thought you might... Members, I've known Mr. That. Swinney, the figures. Members, I'm sorry, I cannot hear a word the First Minister is saying, and I'm sure that we would all like to hear this session. First Minister. Uh, I'm not sure Anna Sarwar will want to hear this, but I certainly want him to. Uh, the figures in the spending review uh, in relation to Audit Scotland are illustrative because we have to have illustrative figures, but they don't replace the independent processes whereby this Parliament scrutinises and determines the budget of Audit Scotland. That's just basic stuff that I would have thought a leader of an opposition party might have known. <laughs> Secondly, on reserves. Uh, the reserves were fully utilised as part of the 21-22 budget, budget management process. They were transparently allocated within the budget revisions. That includes the £134 million of COVID funding, specifically Ring Fence for Health. No funding currently in the Scottish Reserve relates at all to COVID-19 business support funding. Again, basic stuff that I might have thought a leader of an opposition party would have known. Um, and lastly, presiding officer, uh, Anna Sarwar accuses me of being uh, selective in my uh, quoting of the Audit Scotland reports. I'm actually, I've got it here. It's page four. It's the actual report. I'm just going to read from it. The Scottish Government worked collaboratively and at pace with local and UK government to direct significant public spending in difficult circumstances. It's critical that lessons are learned about what uh, worked well and what needs to improve. Uh, secondly, the Scottish Government streamlined governance arrangements to direct funds quickly uh, and it goes on to say yes it's hard to see how some financial decisions were reached but that's because we were uh, acting quickly because it was a global pandemic yeah. thirdly the scottish government directed a large proportion of funding to councils and Briefly, to First other public bodies who had existing systems and local knowledge to enable them to spend quickly uh, and fourthly the scottish government has managed its overall budget effectively yes some covid-19 funding remains unspent but that's because this report didn't go up to the end of the financial year Again, Again, presiding officer, really basic stuff that I would have thought the leader of the opposition would have known. Anna Sarwar. Nicola Sturgeon can be as condescending as she likes. We're used to it. Right? But, the, but the reality is, the reality is she's selectively quoting on one page 
when the report makes clear that it's not clear where the COVID recovery money is going to be spent. And there are billions of pounds of reserves sitting in IGB accounts or in local government accounts. That is money that should be spent on the recovery. And on the spending review, it makes clear year after year after year that it's a standstill budget for the Scottish Parliament and for Audit Scotland. And that means, in real terms, a year after year budget cut for Audit Scotland, meaning clipping their wings. Now, no wonder Nicola Sturgeon wants to hide and distract from her failures, not focusing on the rising child and pensioner poverty on her watch, not focusing on the drugs deaths that have more than doubled on her watch, not focusing on the attainment gap that is still wide open on her watch, not focusing on the 700,000 people waiting on an NHS waiting list on her watch. Instead, what do we get? Not the Nicola Sturgeon we saw during the pandemic, but a return to the Nicola Sturgeon who wants to divide our country and pit Scott against Scott. After 15 years of this SNP government and eight years as First Minister, when will she stop pretending she's in opposition and start governing for the people of Scotland? First Minister. Forgive me, Presiding Officer, but when Anna Sarwar comes to this chamber and just makes basic errors, yeah. it's not condescending to point that out. It's not my job uh, to hide the incompetence of the leader of the Scottish Labour Party. It's my job to put facts in front of the Scottish people. Secondly, uh, Anna Sarwar talks about this government's use of our own powers. He mentioned child poverty. Can I remind him that Scotland is the only part of the UK uh, that has a child payment specifically to lift children out of poverty. And if Anna Sarwar uh, wasn't prepared to continue to support the situation where welfare powers lie in the hands of Tory Prime Ministers and Chancellors, instead get them into the hands of this Parliament, then we could do more and he might just might have a scrap more credibility. And on the issue of Scotland's right to choose, Anna Sarwar is perfectly entitled, although it's beyond me why he would want to, but he's perfectly entitled to team up with the Tories again to oppose independence. That is democracy. What he's not entitled to do is stand in the way of the Scottish people having the democratic right to choose. His position has him at odds with the trade union movement, with the STUC. It has him at odds with the constituency he would like to represent, where 60 per cent of voters backed parties supporting a referendum. It has him at odds with his own party membership. A third of Scottish Labour voters support a second referendum on independence. It has him at odds with his own MPs, MSPs like Alec Rowley and Monica Lenny. Even Jackie Bailey said Labour were wrong to have done uh, a deal with Better Together in the last campaign. But most fundamentally of all, presiding officer, Anas Sarwar's absurd position puts him at odds with any basic notion of democracy. And that's why he'll continue to struggle so badly. We will now move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Natalie Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is supporting Scottish Breastfeeding Week and what steps are being taken to promote the Breastfeeding Friendly Scotland scheme. First Minister. Scottish Breastfeeding Week 2022 is being promoted with a programme of daily events and is supported by NHS boards and third sector partners. The highlight of the week was a breastfeeding celebration event held yesterday at which Marie Todd thanked over 120 delegates from health and the third sector. At that event, we also launched important resources for the promotion, protection and support of breastfeeding in Scotland, a theme running throughout the week is the promotion of the Breastfeeding Friendly Scotland scheme. Work continues to expand and promote the scheme from commercial premises such as shops and cafes to early years and school settings and to our local authorities. Russell Finlay. Okay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Baby J was 11 weeks old when he died in West Lothian. In his short life, he suffered multiple broken bones and other injuries. In this ruling, a judge said there could only have been inflicted by his parents. A social worker and a nurse wanted Baby J placed on the child protection register before he was born. They were overruled. The judge expresses surprise that the council did not instruct a serious case review into his death. This tragedy happened in 2014, but it's only emerged thanks to the Sunday Times. No one has been held to account. Serious questions remain unanswered. First Minister, will you commit to ensuring a full and independent review now takes place and that its findings are made public? First Minister. 
These are uh, tragic and horrific circumstances, and I want today con to convey uh, my deep condolences uh, to the loved ones of, of Baby G. Uh, it is really important in these circumstances that all uh, lessons are learned fully. There are already independent processes in place to ensure that that is the case. Um, in response to this question, of course, uh, I will make sure that I satisfy myself uh, that all of the necessary processes are in place to ensure that all lessons that need to be learned here, and clearly uh, lessons need to be learned, uh, are learned, uh, and that any findings of any uh, of these processes within, obviously, the, the bounds of uh, confidentiality uh, for families uh, are indeed in the public domain. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. This week is the first ever Juvenile Idiopathic Arthritis Week, and I would like to thank members for their support in promoting it and wearing purple, and the activists who have shared their personal stories too. One in a thousand children in Scotland have GIA, so can I also thank, can I ask the First Minister to join me in thanking organisations such as Versus Arthritis and many others and clinicians working tirelessly for the work they are doing to support people living with GIA in Scotland and ask what more the Scottish Government can do to raise awareness of this condition. First Minister. Uh, can I thank uh, Pam Duncan Glancy for raising this really important issue? I, I think the, the first uh, awareness Week here is a real step forward um, and really important, and I'm delighted uh, to support it. Um, I'm also delighted uh, to accept the invitation to pay tribute to organisations like Versus Arthritis, who do fantastic work uh, to raise awareness uh, of the issues that people with GIA uh, experience and also to support uh, those in these circumstances. Uh, I will give a commitment to continue to work with charities and organisations like that to ensure that we do as much as possible uh, to support people. I would be very happy uh, to ask the Health Minister to discuss these issues further with Pam Duncan Glancy so that we are considering everything possible uh, to increase support. Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. Aberdeen International Airport, Port of Aberdeen, Peterhead Port Authority and Aberdeen City and Shire Councils have put a bid together to bring a green free port to the north east of Scotland. This bid has the potential to boost GVA income by £7.5 billion, bring 30,000 jobs to the north east, and it will usher in a new era of investment, innovation, regeneration and opportunities for those that need them most across the north east of Scotland. While I am aware the First Minister cannot support any particular bid, can she give a commitment that the Government will give serious consideration to this bid, and will she join me in recognising the huge benefit the bid could bring to the north east of Scotland? First Minister. Uh, can I thank... Uh, I think we can hear the, the north east contingent in Parliament uh, loudly and clearly. Um, all bids will be treated uh, extremely seriously. Um, I can advise Parliament uh, that applications for green freeport status uh, close on the 20th of June. All bids will be assessed, uh, assessed jointly by the Scottish and the UK Government, with Ministers jointly selecting uh, the winning bids. Uh, as this is a competitive process, uh, as Jackie Dunbar has indicated, I cannot comment on individual bids at this stage, uh, but I would recognise uh, the strong support that Jackie Dunbar has given uh, to this one, which, uh, of course, is of great interest to her constituents. Um, I look forward to receiving strong bids from all around Scotland with ambitious plans that will bring real benefits to Scottish businesses, workers and communities, uh, and that will have a positive and lasting impact on Scotland's economy. A clear contribution to net zero through decarbonisation plans is a core requirement for green free ports and applications should also demonstrate how they will deliver fair work eh, or they will not be supported by the Scottish Government. So let me take the opportunity to wish all bidders well in this process. Annie Wells. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. My constituent, Brage Ward Foley, who suffers from spina bifida, had bladder surgery in April 2019. Since the initial operation, her bowel problems have worsened and the only option is further surgery. Page is admitted to hospital on a four weekly basis as our bowels do not function without a nasal gastric tube. But this treatment is both damaging and becoming less effective over time. And this experience has took an immense physical and mental toll on Breach, and she needs urgent assistance. Her consultants have informed Breach they are prepared for surgery. However, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board continue to delay her vital surgery. So, First Minister, what action could you take to assist my constituent in getting her surgery as quickly as possible? 
First Minister. I thank Harry Wells for raising uh, this issue. I mean, clearly, as I hope she will appreciate, I don't know all of the details uh, other than the, the details she has shared with me in Parliament right now. Um, if she is willing uh, and has the consent of her constituent to share uh, those details and any uh, additional relevant information with the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon, I will ensure uh, that that is looked into as a matter of urgency that we liaise with the Health Board uh, and give a detailed reply to Annie Wells as quickly as possible. Pauline McNeill. Thank you. This week, Callum Steele of the Scottish Police Federation described the pay offered to the police of £565 as derisory. In fact, he said police officers were disgusted at the offer. Police officers are considering taking action to demonstrate the palpable anger their members feel. And this is despite the police doing an exemplary job in the pandemic. And the First Minister referred to the crime figures earlier, on which I'm sure she gives the police some credit for. And this is despite warnings from police, the Police Federation, that over 800 police officers are expected to take early retirement, and this is more than you would expect, because they feel overworked and undervalued. They refer to constant cancellation of their rest days and annual leave. If the government take this seriously, I ask the First Minister, what is she doing to make sure that police officers do not feel undervalued by this government? And what is she doing to make sure that we can pre prevent and encourage police officers to stay in the service and not take advantage of early retirement because we need these officers on the front line? First Minister. Um, firstly, can I uh, say that I pay tribute to police officers and support staff across the country. Um, their service is exemplary. Uh, I would not just give them enormous credit for their contribution to the handling of the pandemic. I would give the police enormous credit uh, to contributing to the well-being of our country. And uh, Polly McNeill is right to say that the figures I quoted earlier about having some of the lowest crime rates uh, since the 1970s is in large part down to the efforts of the police. Uh, that is why we have a higher number of police officers in Scotland now than we did uh, when this government took office. Uh, we have uh, a higher number of police officers proportionately uh, than other parts of the UK. Uh, the starting salary uh, for police officers is higher in Scotland than it is elsewhere in the UK. But I want to see all public sector workers get the fairest possible pay increases, uh, particularly at this time of soaring inflation. Pay negotiations across uh, a range uh, of the, the different parts of the public sector are underway right now. And I think it is obvious the Scottish Government, within the uh, very limited resources we have is seeking to secure as much fairness as possible. Unlike uh, a government elsewhere uh, in these islands, we value deeply the contribution of public sector workers. Specifically in relation to police, police officer pay is negotiated through the Police Negotiating Board. That has been the case for many years. Uh, that process is ongoing in relation to pay for 2022-23. Uh, it would not be appropriate for me in this chamber to cut across that. Uh, following SPA board approval in late May, formal negotiations uh, with trade unions commenced on the 2nd uh, of June. Um, so that process is ongoing and I hope it delivers, uh, as I would say, about all groups in the public sector, uh, the fairest possible outcome um, in the circumstances we are in. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's analysis is of the potential risks to Scotland's economy of the UK Government's proposed legislation to override the Northern Ireland Protocol. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government was not consulted by the UK Government before they took this action, action that risks a hugely damaging self-inflicted trade war in the middle of a cost of living crisis and action which may very well breach international law. Uh, the UK Government is risking sanctions like targeted tariffs that would uh, deeply harm Scottish businesses who are already dealing with an uncertain and unnecessarily bureaucratic uh, environment thanks to Brexit. It is also very likely that it will end discussions across a range of other important issues, including access for our scientists and researchers to the EU's Horizon programme. Uh, Brexit has already made the cost of living crisis much wor worse, but by sparking uh, a trade war, the UK Government risks exacerbating that crisis significantly, and I hope common sense uh, and decency on the part of the UK Government quickly prevails. Maggie Chapman. I thank the First Minister for that response. By seeking to override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol, the UK Government is putting the economic well-being of the North of Ireland behind their desire to impose their Brexit-infused British ideology on people. Such unilateral action also damages trust in politics. We know, as the First Minister has said, Brexit is already damaging Scottish businesses. 
Indeed, some businesses in the North East, in my region, have decided to stop all international business due to Brexit. What can we do to ensure that any actions by the EU in response to the UK riding roughshod over international treaties does not further damage Scotland's economy? And does she agree that independence for Scotland is now very clearly the best route to secure our country's position as an outward-looking and internationally responsible European nation? First Minister. Well, uh, Maggie Chapman's question is uh, absolutely correct. Uh, everything she said is correct. Uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, let us not forget, was negotiated and signed by this UK government. Um, it is also uh, a protocol right now that is benefiting Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland's economy right now is doing better than the economies uh, of the other countries in the UK. As First Minister of Scotland, if I could get a protocol that would allow Scotland to continue to trade freely across the single market, uh, I would take that in a heartbeat. So that is... Uh, the reality. We also have a government that is showing no respect uh, for the rule of law, for international law or for the basic norms uh, of our democracy. I quoted from the letter from Christopher Gait, uh, the now resigned ethics adviser to the Prime Minister. Let me quote just another line because I don't know whether it is referring to the protocol, but it may be, uh, where he says that this week he was tasked to offer a view about the government's intention to consider measures which risk a deliberate deliberate and purposeful breach of the ministerial code. Yes. That is what the UK government uh, is now behaving like. So can I finally, presiding officer, um, well, I actually slightly disagree with Maggie Chapman. I don't think it is the case that independence is now the best route for us to secure our status in the European Union as an outward-looking country. I think independence is now our only yes. route to doing that. <laughs> Question number four, Emma Harper. To ask the First Minister, in light of summer officially commencing next week on 21st of June, what action the Scottish Government is taking to promote responsible access to Scotland's countryside? First Minister. Uh, well, it's very pleasing to see that summer may have unofficially commenced already in Scotland. Uh, long may it continue. Um, Nature Scott is the lead Scottish Government public body for access to the countryside. It works with the national parks and other key partners on raising awareness of the Scottish Outdoor Access Code. Uh, last year, Nature Scott's traditional and social media activity saw over 15 million impressions, driving over half a million page views on the Scottish Outdoor Access Code website. A further campaign is already underway for this summer. It will inform campers of their responsibilities, including around people and pet behaviour and good practice in relation to fires and waste disposal. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for her response. More people will be enjoying Scotland's bonny countryside, but it is so important they do so responsibly. As the First Minister will know, my Livestock Worrying Act is now law and increases the penalties for those who allow dogs to worry or attack livestock. So will the First Minister join me in encouraging everyone to follow the Scottish Outdoor Access Code to keep their dogs under control when in the countryside? And will she join me in commending the vital work of the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime? First Minister. Yes, these are really important points uh, for Emma Harper to make. Uh, of course, everyone should follow the access code. And it's worth pointing out, indeed, that access rights only apply to dog walking if the dog is under proper control. Uh, I do also commend the vital work of the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime, uh, their livestock attack and distress campaign with the slogan, Your Dog, Your Responsibility, to educate dog owners about the new legislation is key to awareness raising and bringing an end to the associated unnecessary suffering for all involved. Police Scotland and farming and crofting stakeholders combine their efforts to address these crimes and the Scottish Government also campaigns with the SSPCA. Uh, the small minority who do not treat livestock with respect and care must be held accountable and consequences must appropriately reflect the severity of their crimes. Question number five, Craig Hoy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the Scottish Government's policy regarding investment in nuclear fusion technology. First Minister. Uh, we are aware of the increasing interest in the development of fusion energy, which of course is different from traditional nuclear energy. We should never close our minds uh, to new technology. It is clear, though, that there is a very long way to go uh, still in terms of fully understanding both the risks and opportunities that fusion energy technology presents. 
The Scottish Government's position on traditional nuclear energy has not and will not change. Uh, we do not support the building of new nuclear power stations in Scotland, uh, and therefore that will not feature as part of our wider energy strategy review due to be published later this year. Uh, we will continue to assess any such new technologies based on safety, value for consumers and contribution to Scotland's low-carbon economy and energy future. Craig Hoy. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but note that she is non-committal on fusion and will still use the planning system to shut down Scotland's traditional nuclear energy industry. Scientists at the UK-based Jet Technology have set a new record for the amount of energy produced in their quest to produce nuclear fusion. This offers the potential of virtually unlimited supplies of safe, low-carbon, low low-radiation energy. Why won't the First Minister give a guarantee that her government will allow Scotland to benefit from this technology when it becomes commercially available, or is caving in to the anti-science, anti-nuclear dogma of the Greens yet another price that she will pay for them propping up the SNP's plan for an illegal wildcat referendum next October? First Minister, members. There's a real obsession on the part of the Tory benches today. I think they might be feeling a wee bit under pressure and uncomfortable because they know that a referendum will be legal and it is coming, presiding officer. On the issue at stake, uh, however, yes, I'm non-committal on fusion energy. It would be irresponsible to be anything other because there is an awful long way to go uh, before any of us fully understand either the risks or indeed the opportunities that that technology might present. It is probably decades uh, before we could uh, see any plants uh, operating and a lot of understanding needs to be built along the way. Uh, we will not close our minds, uh, but nor we will, will we jump to conclusions uh, while that work uh, has to be done. In terms of traditional nuclear energy, um, our position is well known. Let me just uh, quote the, the chair of the nuclear consulting uh, group. The central message repeated again and again uh, that a new generation of nuclear will be clean and safe is a fiction. The reality is nuclear is an extremely costly and inflexible technology with the potential to cause significant uh, harm. Uh, we have massive uh, renewable potential and this government is going to focus on making sure we fully realise that. Yeah, yeah. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to tackle the reported growing use of locum staff in the NHS. First Minister. The use of temporary staffing in the NHS, be that locum agency or bank staff, is a very small fraction of NHS staffing. Uh, these temporary staff were vital during the height of the pandemic, not least to deliver our vaccination programme. Uh, the majority of temporary staffing cost comes from the NHS staff bank, uh, who of course are NHS staff members on NHS rates of pay. Every health system has to make some use of temporary or agency uh, staffing. Uh, let me just illustrate that. In 2021, agency spending in NHS England uh, was 23% higher than in Scotland. And in Labour-run Wales, agency spending was 79% higher than it was in Scotland. NHS staffing in Scotland is at a record high level and as set out in our recent workforce strategy, we are committed to growing the NHS workforce further. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for her response, but remind her, of course, that people in this chamber are responsible for the NHS in Scotland, and perhaps she should spend her time focusing on that, because agency spend has risen, has risen to £423 million in 2021-22, a 30% increase on the previous year. And yes, we have had a pandemic, but most of this is down to the increasing level of vacancies for nurses, doctors and consultants. The First Minister may be aware that currently nurses are quitting the NHS to work for private agencies who then in turn place them back in the NHS to cover staff shortages. They can earn more in a weekend than they do all week working in the NHS. The consequences, more vacancies and more money wasted on sticking plaster solutions. So what action will the First Minister take to end the costly and growing use of agency staff in our NHS. 
First Minister. Firstly, Presiding Officer, I am responsible, this Government is responsible for NHS Scotland, but as I have said uh, before, and I am sorry to disappoint Labour, as I am sure I will say again, if Labour are coming to this chamber to say Labour would do things so much better, it is perfectly reasonable to look at the record in the part of the UK where Labour is currently in Government uh, and draw our own conclusions on whether that is true uh, or not. Um, secondly, uh, we have uh, a record number of workers in our NHS, even taking account of vacancies. I'm talking about staff currently in post, increased under this government by almost uh, 30,000. Um, and yes, demand is growing. We've had a pandemic. Uh, that has meant some uh, workers in our NHS have been off sick due to having COVID. It's meant that uh, additional things, not least the vaccination programme, uh, have had to be undertaken. I don't know what Jackie Bailey is suggesting, that we should just have left uh, those posts somehow unfilled and not uh, had those services delivered. Is that what a Labour government would do? If that is the case, then I think people will certainly draw conclusions from that. Final two points, presiding officer. The majority of temporary staffing comes from the staff bank. Uh, these are NHS staff on NHS contracts at NHS rates of pay. Uh, and finally, Jackie Bailey asked me, what action are we taking? Well, we have already acted to ensure record numbers of staff in our NHS, higher numbers of staff proportionately than in England and in Wales. And what we will do is continue to grow the NHS workforce so that it can meet the demands of the people of Scotland in the years to come. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business, which is a member's business debate in the name of Christine Graham.